Hey everybody out there on YouTube, welcome to the show show pre-show show cocktail hour. I'm Jay, that's Aaron. Hey And that's Tony. Hello. And today we are here to talk about Midnight Mass. And I have before me what would be called in, I think, anywhere in Texas, a michelada. I think if you were to order one of these at Modine's, you might ask for a Saskatchewan Caesar. But it is a concoction where it's basically, if you're familiar with a, a Caesar or a Bloody Mary, it's that. But instead of vodka, it's beer. Mm. Is it Michelot? Like the, is it a soft ch or is it a k? That's a soft Because Michelob, right? <laughs> right. It's not Michelob. But I think I don't think Michelob comes from Spanish. Mm-hmm. Mm. I figured got to have some kind of drink with tomato juice, given the subject matter. <laughs> it it feels appropriate. Feels appropriate. You guys stepping on anything nice? Uh, no, I have a uh, just a Coke Zero tonight. But I will say, me and Christy have been trying out um, mixing the Mountain Dew. I think it's called Spark. It's their, um, like, raspberry lemonade Mountain Dew. And mm. mixing that with vodka. And it kind of tastes like a pink flavor pop popsicle. And is, like, the best. Like, it's amazing. Sounds, delicious. sounds delicious. I love Code Red and Livewire, which is, like, the orange one. Mm-hmm. And that one is delish. They're doing some really fun experimentation. Let's just say that. <laughs> I got a DP Zero. Should have put some wild turkey in there, though. Wild turkey. Some wild turkey liquor. I don't know about these 100 proof, dude, like 100 proof bourbon whiskeys that are like delicious in mixed drinks. Like Mm. Coke Zero, Dr. Pepper Zero. (laughs) They just hit that spot. I remember we had a professor that would always talk about wild turkey and uh, I drank some and I mixed it with cherry Pepsi at the time. And I I don't Mm. remember it being particularly good or bad, but I remember drinking it. I don't know about regular, but the 101 is good. I got yelled at by that professor because I referred to wild turkey as being 80 proof, and he accepts no 80 proof wild turkey. It is only 101. That's not real Um, wild turkey. That's not real wild turkey liquor. No. That's watered down stuff. Well, how is your, uh, how is your Michelada? Oh, it is. It's very tasty. Ever since I was turned on to Caesars by Letterkenny, uh, and I've, I've, I'm no longer afraid of Clamato. <laughs> I'm not afraid really of the it. Most important thing. I'm not afraid of it, but I just don't want to have anything to do with it. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> but bef- before I've, I've been trying to make my own perfect Michelada for a long time, but I used to just use commercially available Bloody Mary mix and That'll that'll get you so far, but I really wanted to be able to make my own, and to make your own, you really gotta you gotta start with that nice clamato base, and mm. especially because it's now football season, and you know, what are you gonna drink during football season other than beer? It's a good question. And clam tomato juice. <laughs> tomato clam broth cocktail, sir. Respect the ingredients. Am I off the hook for drinking seltzers if it's if beer gives my tummy some problems? Does that give me like an out that I can be a seltzer person without being yeah, a bro? Because they're pretty good. Dude, bro culture has changed, especially when it comes to seltzers. You know, I think especially the younger generation has embraced the whole I'm not going to yuck your yums thing. So, you know, ain't no laws when you're drinking White Claws, man. Is that the saying? Did, That's did, what the bros are saying. Did South Park get it right? Did PC Principal and all that stuff like happen? Like now it's like, hey, we're all super cool bros now. I think a lot of them are. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, if you're into testing it out, some, those Topo Chico Margarita seltzers are pretty tasty. Oh yeah, yeah, they're pretty good. And there's these White Claw Surges that are like 8% alcohol by volume. And I'm not going to say they taste good, but it's like, give me Chew High vibes. Ah, Chew High. Got to go for that cost per, that alcohol per cost. (laughs) (laughs) 
Well, you guys want to get into Midnight Mass? Yeah, let's do, do it. it. Alrighty. Lighting my seance candles. Previously on the show show. <laughs> Uh, we're here to talk about Severance, the Apple TV Plus television series, but here we've gathered for a cocktail first, and I am making uh, what is sometimes referred to as an Irish car bomb. I might call this an Irish Kier bomb, uh, mm. because I feel like this represents the show in a couple of ways. Uh, first, if you if you don't know what a what kind of drink I'm talking about, what this is, is you take about a half of a pint of Guinness... Yeah, you just heard that right there. Uh, you is, pour that the that in. is that the nitrogenated Guinness? Or? Yes. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure. You're, uh, or I should probably be a little more generic with this, shouldn't I? Uh, so you take some Irish stout, some uh, schminis, if you will, and put that into a pint glass, and then you pour yourself a shot of half Irish cream, some schmalies, and then half <laughs> Irish whiskey, uh, some schmamison. Tony and I like to drink... Uh, Shmamison and ginger ale when we're in Vegas together. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we do. Uh, so then you take that shot, you drop it into your Shminis, and then you down it. Okay. Once they become official sponsors, they can get rid of the Shma. Exactly. So, Slancha. A little. Oh, yeah, Slancha. Smacha? I know season two's been announced, but I'm guessing it's not. Like, they better not come out with it until the rider stuff gets settled. Cause... It's on hiatus until yeah. until all that goes down. I'm I'm sorry. Is it a, is it an Irish contract? It's on hiatus. hiatus. It's just a fun word to say. <laughs> so there was my brief way of saying I have nothing to talk about. Well, I I have to say I definitely am in the situation where I'm probably going to try and burn through any shows worth watching on Apple so I can cancel it and Ooh. stop paying for it. Foundation. Mm-hmm. Second season just came out. Check that shit out. It's great. I've heard Silo's good. Is Silo good too? Oh, I haven't watched Silo. I also heard that the one with uh, the one that's basically phone booth but airplanes with Idris Elvis on it. Whew, let me get rid of this, uh, this burp real quick. It's messed up. It's messed up. <sighs> it's been a long week, and I'm very happy to be talking <laughs> about TV shows with you guys. Hello, hello, and welcome to the show show, probably the world's best TV review podcast. Warmest greetings, and welcome to episode 63. Here today, we review the 2021 Horror Limited series from the king of the Horror Limited series, Mike Flanagan. Welcome to God's Army. We're going to do great things together. This month on the show show, Midnight Mass. It's time to heave to, trice up, mill about smartly throughout the premises. I'd like to welcome you inside the broadcast booth. I'm Jay. I'm joined, as always, by my two Hall of Famers. To my left, the boy with the booming system, top-down AC with the cooling system, it's Aaron. Amen. And to my other left, he ill, he real, he might got a deal, he pop bottles, and he got the right kind of build, it's Tony. Yeah, I love that, Nikki. Check out our Instagram for news about the show, including our postponed 2024 tour convention and cruise, along with plenty of other bonus content. You can find us on Instagram at the show show pod. Send your emails to the show show TV podcast at gmail.com. Find our YouTube page, Mandamus Radio. You can find me individually at J. Suisponte. Aaron, where can we find you? On X. He throws up the X. At Tenacious Aaron. He's always on X. How about you, Tony? <laughs> you can find me on Instagram at T Quite. Very nice, very nice. The show show is now available everywhere podcasts are sold. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Audible, Castbox, Overcast, Pocket Cast, and Radio Public. Of course, you can always check us out on YouTube. As we mentioned, Mandamus Radio. Check us out there for our bonus pre-show cocktail hour. Well, we are here to talk about Midnight Mass. Before we get there, let's take a short little trip over to the unofficial scoreboard. This is where uh, we catch up a little bit on what else we've been doing. 
What have you boys been watching? What have you guys been playing? What have you been doing? Tony, you want to go first? I'll go first because I don't really have anything. I don't think I've been up to much. It's been a decently quick turnaround since our last pod. I think I'd probably already seen Barbie and Oppenheimer before the last one. No, I don't think we, if you had, we hadn't gotten your report. So please. Both good. I mean, Barbie, like you hear that it's like really, I, I didn't find it to be as in your face, like down with the patriarchy as like the internet would lead you to believe. I found it funny. And I mean, I think if you're like, if you go in knowing that there's a little bit of that in there, I don't think there's anything to take too seriously. I think it equally digs on women as it does on men, if you're worried about that. I think as long as you're not Ben Shapiro, you'll probably be fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oppenheimer, great, too. Definitely long. Probably like a one-time every once in a while. It's not going to be a rewatch all the time for me, I don't think. But great movie. A lot more nudity than I've seen in previous Chris Nolan films. <laughs> he, has, he has to drop the bomb in more ways than one. <laughs> Well, I have been, number one, continuing on in Farscape, which is very, very good. Um, me and Christy bought it in Blu-ray and have, are, in, are entering into the third season. Um, and, uh, the show, uh, gets quite visceral at times and definitely has some challenging moral questions. So it's been fun continuing on. I would love to hear what Jay thought about it continuing on. So in the future, I'd love to see that. But the other thing, this is what I've been sinking most of my time into lately, is uh, World of Warcraft classic hardcore servers came out, which is the 2004 original World of Warcraft game that was re-released in 2019. But the hardcore servers, essentially, you have one life. If you die for whatever reason, DC, you, you pull too many enemies, your, your dungeon, you know, fucks up a mechanic and y'all just wipe your character's done. Like you gotta start back from level one. Um, and so it has created a whole new kind of community and ecosystem in the game. Um, especially cause like most of the players are between like one and 25, <laughs> 85 to 90% of the people die before 25 and the level cap is 60, but the, uh, one guild has got 60 team, uh, players together. They've done the first raid. No one died 40 men in the raid. Um, so they've leveled to 60, they've done all the dungeons and they've done the first raid. And I just think it's really, really crazy. But it's it's brought like storytelling back to like video gaming. Like me and my buddies, we get together and talk about close calls where like our character almost died, or about seeing a level sixty character dying in a dungeon or something like that. Uh, like war stories. <laughs> like war stories. But then also there's an add-on called Deathlog, and it's recording everyone's death on the server and your last words. And so you get to see what people's last words are after, like, when they die. And it, some of it is hilarious, like really, really <laughs> ridiculous stuff. <laughs> so it's, it's been really fun. It's been very ex exhilarating, but like, I think I've spent like the entire weekend just like sinking into this game and I've got a level 28 character and a level 20 character and I haven't lost them yet. So hmm. wow. we're on the journey to 60 boys. <laughs> Is there a way to like quick close the app without it nope. killing your character? Nope. No. If it's a DC and you you don't get back on before your character gets killed by the thing you're fighting, then it's just done. Oh man! So it's the 2004 code. It's been it's clean polished. It's been fixed a bunch, but um, it's it's a bit janky at times. So because of that, though, everyone like like the game has been played to hit like. To the nines, right? Like every, all the different secrets and all the different details about everything have been figured out. So you can go and look up stuff. There's guides. Oh yeah. The add on also tells you which enemies are like the most dangerous. Like you walk up, you hover your mouse over. It's like, Oh, this is the 39th most deadliest enemy on, on the server because of how many times it's killed somebody when they fought it. So that's, that's kind of cool too, to, as you run around seeing like, Oh wow, this people are dying to this one a lot. This sucks. <laughs> oh, and you, you see people's bodies on the ground and you're like, Oh, here lies dumb shorts. He obviously <laughs> couldn't make it. 
the only having one life thing that that's an interesting way to refresh it and it kind of reminds me of if you remember golden eye 64 mm-hmm. where the wasn't the highest difficulty setting like one shot kill yeah yeah that's, that's what that reminds you me have of. to play perfectly like did mm-hmm. it go both ways like you kill people in one shot no, I think it was just you died. Oh, yeah. If, if you got hit once, you were done. You just had to know the pattern of everything in the game. Yeah, basically. <laughs> but no, yeah, it, it's it's exhilarating I'm playing with my cousin. I'm playing with Adam. And so we're, we're playing together, and there have been a couple of close calls where, like, it's just, like, run. And, and, <laughs> and we're just, like, running for our lives. <laughs> So, but it is, it is fun. And I, I can't, I couldn't believe that I would have this much fun. Like whenever someone told me, oh, you play World of Warcraft all the way to 60 and have one life. If you die, you lose everything. I was like, oh, that sounds awful. And it's, it's been some of the most fun I've had in the game in like probably the last year. Very cool. So that's, that's been my uh, unofficial. Very nice. What about you, Jay? I've I've been watching a few things. I think the one that's most worth talking about is the show that's been called by me the greatest of its generation, uh, which is Succession. I finally finished the final season and oh. it's fantastic. Absolutely great show. But if you guys can remember, uh, in our last episode of the show show, a little subject of the rule against perpetuities <laughs> came up. And I think that just implanted the seed in my head where in the last season of Succession, there's a, uh, I won't say who, but there's a character who's pregnant. And I kept waiting for there to be some kind of legal shenanigans about some kind of inheritance having to do with this yet unborn to child. be born heir. And so I'm sitting there waiting up until the final moment, like, oh, when is that going to come back? And then it never did. I was just, you know, it was all in my head. <laughs> so thanks, Aaron. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> but uh, another thing I'll, I'll mention about it is that in the, the penultimate episode, it revolves around the presidential election, a, a fictional one with fictional candidates. But they concoct a scenario where a vote counting center in Milwaukee burns down on Election Day and with it thousands of absentee ballots, which is kind of a a brilliant nightmare scenario for an election and was was really fun to see play out amongst those crazy characters so like in how would you rank overall succession like what would your score be oh like on our uh if if we were to to put that on the on the official scoreboard yeah where would you put it oh boy it's not a 10 it was a great, great, great show. I'd say probably eight and a half. Mm. It's respectable. It's good. And I think if I were to to make a list of the greatest dramedies of all time, which I'm I'm a huge dramedy fan myself, like it's up there, if not at the at the top, number one. I, I can understand that. Everyone tells me how amazing it is. I just I I I don't know. Going through the last era has not been fun to just watch rich people do terrible things. I hyper decant. You don't hyper decant? You're just doing regular decanting? Yeah, fair enough. It's yeah. it's not not exactly for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is all I've got for the unofficial scoreboard. You guys ready to go to church? Let's do Take it. Take me to church. All right, we have gathered here to discuss Midnight Mass, and this was selected, or this was selected, of course, by the Wheel of Randomonium, but it was nominated there by Aaron. Tell us about Midnight Mass. Well, number one, um, this is our second show by Mike Flanagan, and as you indicated during the um, preamble of the show, that he he is the master of miniseries. And uh, I really kind of enjoy the one and dones. Like it's refreshing in American television to have shows that just kind of come to a natural conclusion. Um, but we we watched Midnight Mass, which is a American Gothic supernatural horror streaming television miniseries. 
uh, which aired on Netflix. And the premise uh, surrounds the uh, return of a young man named Riley Flynn to his hometown on the island of Crockett. Um, he's hoping to rebuild his life after se- serving four years in prison for um, killing someone during a drunk driving incident. Um, he arrives at the same time as a mysterious yet charismatic young priest uh, who begins to revitalize the town's fly, just, you know, flagging fly. <laughs> I've been drinking a little bit. Floundering? Floundering faith. Let's go with that. Uh, (laughs) Having, however, the community's divisions are soon exacerbated by the priest's deeds while mysterious events befall the small town. Okay, so that's kind of the the Wikipedia summary. But essentially we have our main cast of characters is the the Flynn family, uh, Riley, his parents, his brother. We have... The priest, which we all know is actually Monsignor, the original priest who was running the church, who had gone off to Israel, met a vampire, Ah, ah, ah. came back a young man. Um, We have Bev, Bev. who is one of the religious zealots from the church, who definitely it kind of, you know, overbearingly runs the island and the church. And I guess like... We have the sheriff, who is one of my favorite characters, uh, Sheriff Hassan, who's um, he's played by, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Is it Ra- Raul Kohli? But he plays Ravi in one of my favorite shitcoms, I Zombie. He plays a, a coroner, uh, which he's really silly. And in this, he's really serious. He's so, so much better as a serious actor. <laughs> but and then we have the doctor. um was it Dr. Sarah, who is the local do- uh, doctor who is also servicing um, Aaron Green, who is a pregnant lady on the island. And uh, the story kind of revolves around F- uh, Riley Flynn, Aaron Green, and the doctor and and these people. So the, the priest returns to town. Riley returns. He's trying to rebuild his life. The priest is kind of trying to get uh, the faith of the island going again. And miracles start happening, right? And mysterious things start happening on the island, and people's lives start getting better. People are healed. People are healed. There's a, a, a girl named Lisa, Lisa, who is the mayor's daughter, who is handicapped. She was handicapped in a hunting accident by a, a local drunk, and she all of a sudden starts to walk again, right? We're, we're seeing things happen on the island, what we, what the people don't know is that the things are happening because the priest essentially has been turned into a vampire uh, uh, uh. and is feeding them all vampire blood. And it apparently is fixing all of their ailments. Well, we never find out if it was a vampire or an angel. <laughs> well, I'm going to go with... <laughs> I'm going to say that this is a very, very creative way or creative interpretation of the classic vampire story. Right? Like, we have the vampire that's hunting the, or or basically feasting on this small little town, and we have this mixture of Catholic imagery and Christian, you know, concepts with the, you know, vampire idea. And I think that they do a really good job of kind of wrapping these up together, right? Like it really melds well because like whenever we, I, I've heard sermons like the Easter sermon or the good Friday sermon that we're all going to be soldiers one blood alone moves the wheels of history because like that, that is that fired up like hellfire and brimstone pastor speak. And they, I felt why he was talking like that after everything that had happened that day. Like, I could feel his energy and the fact that it was tied to this vampire story and, and everything. I thought it was just creative. Yeah. I like it. How they made a lot of things like they tied, like oh, you must drink the blood and eat the body and all this stuff. Like, like how they tie that to vampirism. Mm-hmm. You, who you choose to take communion with or share communion with and, and you'll know God will tell you, you'll feel compelled. So I see, I've seen this before. So I'm really curious about Jay, who number one is not really strong on violence and gore and or horror. I want to know your thoughts on this. Well, to, to give my usual gore reports, this show didn't really get all that gory until the end. Mm. I've only seen this and Hill house. I haven't seen any uh, other, other Mike Flanagan stuff, but in, in both of those, 
I really like his restraint in the horror or the shocking aspects where it, it really feels like when he does do a jump scare or if he does do something gross, they earn it. Yeah, I agree. I think this this show continued that that tradition. I think the the girl that Riley kept seeing, uh, my my lady wife kept referring to that as a jump scare. I don't know if I'd label it that myself, but we both agreed it was it was really effective imagery, especially with the the police lights flashing in the glass, like embedded in her face. Mm-hmm. Like that was really, really great at getting across very quickly just the the level of guilt that Riley must be feeling coming back into the story. What he can't what he can't shake. Right. Agreed. I wish the first time I wish they did it. I wish they just left it. Like I thought it was I was so happy before it showed her again, like because it shows her the first time, like when he's in prison or whatever. And then I was like really, really loving the fact that when it when he was at home, it started showing the red and blue lights on his face, like reflecting. I was like, oh, that's so good. But then it showed her. I was like, I wish it would have just shown the lights reflecting on his face, like as it zoomed in on his face. So you, you'd still know what he was seeing, but I don't know. You felt I, I like felt haunted. Point. I felt haunted like him. You know, like you understood mm-hmm. why. Whenever Monsignor was sitting there, and he's like. What does it make you feel when I tell you that I don't have any guilt that I ate Joe? You know, and he's like <laughs> jealous. Like, mm-hmm. that's why that scene is impactful is because you see how haunted he is by what he did. Right. It's not just that because you could you could reinterpret just seeing the lights as being arrested. He regrets being arrested, you know, but it's it's not even that it's it's. You know, he has to get a forgiven by her during his DMT trip to the sun um, at the end, right? Like, that's what he's thinking about at the very end. Not not Aaron. He's, th- he's thinking about the girl that he killed and getting forgiveness mm-hmm. from her. That's the last moment of Riley's existence. I don't know. I, I feel like this is where I agree with, with Jay. He uses the gore or violence or whatever in impactful ways. It's not gratuitous. But but when it becomes necessary, he does use it, right? Like when we get to the end and the church scene, like that scene is violent. But it's also like been building to that over the last like episode and a half, right? Mm-hmm. And it kind of sets up the, the whole ravenous plot at the end. And, you know, I love how he, he brings hubris back in. Like the ancient Greeks would be proud to see hubris once mm-hmm. again turning its ugly head and <laughs> causing the destruction of all these people's lives because burning down your everything that you could possibly hide from the sun in and again not thinking <laughs> to dig a hole immediately yes yes or just like oh, run to like i saw a bunch of like exposed like basements like you can't just dive in there and get underneath the rubble like who cares if you burn all you need is a blanket like, yeah a tarp you know. <laughs> uh, go under that bridge where they dropped their daughter off. Yeah, these people didn't think ahead. No, they decided yeah. to just sing, you know, some some hymnals. What do you think about the main, the OG vampire, bro? Like, is that like the old vampire form? Uh, uh, uh. Or is that what, if everyone kept giving in to their instincts, they'd eventually like turn into if they just kept going without caring? Just like an animal. Because it's usually like those are what the OG vampires look like, and then like the new ones are like humans, but they're vampires. Like, so I'm gonna go with underworld kind of theory, where like you have the werewolf that's like the natural werewolf, and then there's the werewolf mm-hmm. that's like humans that have been turned into. And yeah. so, like, I would say like that he's like a naturally occurring vampire, and then like whoever he infects with it, they become a variant of vampire like him but they don't become fully i don't think they ever like straight up grow wings <laughs> but i i will say this this thing has to have hunted humans long enough to understand priestcraft and clothing and everything perfectly right because he just like walks into the church wearing the robes and is like i'm an angel i get it how did, how did he survive like, going to hibernation 
in that I mean, little desert cave. Obviously, you know, he was feasting off of tourists in Israel. Oh. You know, every once in a while, they just some fat Americans would fall into a hole. And- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering what he's thinking strategically here. That's what, yeah. Where if it was the OG vampires plan to take over the world, are you going to start that from a cave off of the road to Damascus? Or are you going to start that from an isolated island in unspecified North America? So I, I, I don't think that the angel gave two shits about taking over anything. I think that the angel enjoyed having things to feast on. Right. Mm. And so like the angel was like down for what Monsignor was doing because it increased the amount of things that he could feast on. They were then going to go to the mainland. Right. That means that he was going to go to the mainland. There's a lot of food at the mainland. I just kind of took it as the angel was like, yeah, whatever he says goes. Yeah. I think that that's really serves the, the message of this show about people perverting Maybe not even perverting is the right word, but harnessing other forces and then kind of slapping their own branding on it. Yep. No, I would agree. I definitely think that one of the main themes of this is kind of like the lens through which you see things, right? Like even the discussion between Riley and Aaron Green about death and what happens after you die. Like, it's just them sharing their perspectives on it. And I thought that they did a really good job of bringing that back around at the end. I didn't like the end. I really liked their conversation on the couch, but I did not like her death scene. It just like really took me out. I started zoning out like almost immediately when she started talking in that part. <laughs> I was like, it was not landing with me. I don't know. It's it's nice to have shows where not everything is pretty pink bowed, right? Like two people made it off the island, but like it, I mean, it's not necessarily Game of Thrones, but this was a show where there were casualties all the way across the board. So I, I, I hear you that I don't know. Like, like I think that the angel, why is he grabbing her? How does he know what gasoline is? If he's been in a Damascus cave this whole time, but um, <laughs> I don't know why he wants to make other vampires. I don't know that he, he's just, I think he's just like that. They, they, he can he apparently can keep feeding on them. I think that that's the thing is they're not fully vampire till they die. So like whenever he like you lets his blood heal them, he can keep feeding on them, keep them alive. Right? Cuz I the thing that I couldn't understand is why Monsignor didn't burst into flames the moment he walked out of the cave. Right? Yeah. I figured it out. It's it's dumb. He hadn't I figured died it yet. Out. He hadn't died yet. Why is Riley? Cuz Riley's neck gets broken, right? Monsignor has to break Riley's neck back into place in order for Riley to heal. Whereas Monsignor only was bitten, so he has the virus, but he doesn't die. He heals from the bite. So that's that's essentially the theory. Now, why does he die? Well, apparently Bev's poisoning him. If you notice, Bev poisons the rats, poisons the dog. Monsignor dies the same way Spike does. Yeah. So why is it? Well, it's because Bev has been running the show while Monsignor was a crazy old Alzheimer's patient, right? So... Alzheimer, sorry. So we, th- it's kind of weird. Some of the storytelling I felt was kind of disjointed in that way because I didn't catch a lot of these pieces the first time at all. I was like, oh, I guess the the vampire's blood is ultimately poisonous, and you're just gonna die eventually. You're gonna get super healthy and then die. And then I like started looking things up in the internet. And they're like, no, Bev killed him. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I guess that makes sense. There's a lot of references to her having poison. I did like it. It was that was a nice little. It was almost like Walking Dead, mm. where everyone's already a zombie. They just have to die. I did like that part of the vampire because usually it's like the vampire just like drains them of their blood until they die, and then they feed them their blood and they become a vampire. But I kind of liked it where they're already drinking the vampire's blood. So the only thing left for them to do is die, and that was a pretty nice little twist vampire change up thing. That, them being compelled to, you know feast as soon as they woke up too that's another thing i have problems with because it's just like that was inconsistent to me well like i guess riley bro- drank that cup so i guess maybe he couldn't fight it off but then after that he was like chill but then like his dad and his mom were just like you we're know what i mean like we we don't want to hurt people but then other people are like mom 
my own children, my wife, I'll murder them. I don't give a frick. So it's like, what? Is it that bad or is it not that bad? Because it was not that bad for his parents or him, apparently. But then, like, these other people are murdering their closest family members without any sort of regret until they wake up from it. No, I, I definitely think there's some inconsistencies in how everyone was affected by it. Although I think that part of the argument that is being made by the dad is that, you know, if you give into your base desires, then or can't can't stop yourself from giving into your base desires, then yeah, you're you're gonna feed. But if you have that, I guess, more level of control or discipline, then you can say no. I also think that it's not like he was around anybody. He got eaten and everybody else left. I can't believe the mom killed herself. That's a, that's a hard thing to do. Stab yourself in the throat. Ooh, and yeah. she was so devout that she knows that's like, if she's super Catholic, she's going to hell. She might think being a vampire also sends you to hell. She, all she had to do was not die. <laughs> I mean, I guess one what? thing you're not killing yourself and you're getting killed, I guess. But well, I think Aaron says something along the lines of, if we're sacrificing ourselves to contain this contagion on the island to protect the outside world, oh, yeah. and we're killing ourselves point. for people we don't know, that's the highest love. That might be what the mom's operating off of. That's a good point. That, that's another, yeah, another way to view it. There's no greater love than for a man to lay down his life for for his friends. So, that's a good point. I I think that this is, in my opinion, of the three. I've seen all three of of Flanagan shows, and. I think this is the best of his. I think the acting is really good. I really like Monsignor. Like, I thought he knocked it out of the park. Yeah, his performance was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And especially the episode where he was explaining everything to Riley yeah. in the gym. The the two of them in that whole episode back and forth, absolutely fantastic. Yeah, so good. I, I just liked him as a character, as an actor, all around. I, I thought that he did a great job. I liked him a, a ton. I didn't like him as much when he was louder. I loved it when he was soft spoken, but the few times in his sermons he kept really like animated and loud. Like the last one was good, but like the other like one or two that he had before that, I was like, I liked him better when he's just like more like calm and like he was felt more persuasive when he's just like really even kill and chill. Oh, but he felt unhinged, right? Like that's what was great about it was that he like he's starting like it's one of those things where like I'm a good person, I'm trying to do a good thing. Yeah, I'm doing something horrible. Yeah, I'm non-consensually giving everyone biological agents that they don't know what could happen to them, and I'm saying it's God's will. Uh, you know, you start to kind of have to double down, triple down, and ignore the voices in your head that are like, this is fucking crazy. So, <laughs> like, I, I feel like to some level as it goes on, he becomes more and more unhinged until you get to the, the God's Army sermon. And it's him getting shot in the head and kind of waking up and seeing everyone gone and the blood everywhere, realizing, oh, no, I I was wrong. This is not right. <laughs> <laughs> Along those same lines, I thought Bev was also excellent. She was. And yeah. Bev might be my favorite character. Not that I liked her or agreed with her at all, but that she felt the most real. I've known so many Bevs. Mm -hmm. I grew up going to youth group with so many Bevs. Yeah. And the monologue that the mom had at the end where she tells Bev that she's not a good person, I think is something that a lot of Bevs out there need to hear. Yep. No, yeah, I, I like that where she's like, why are you so mad that God loves other people as much as you? Yes. She's like, yes, tell her. Great line. Do it. <laughs> I liked, uh, was it Jack or John? Collie, the drunk guy, the alcoholic? Joe. Joe. Joe Collie. Joe. Yeah, I liked him a lot. Something about the actor, I guess, just like I feel bad for Joe. He just felt like a felt, felt like a friend or something. His poor dog. Why do they gotta do a dog like that? Yeah, that was I, I fast forwarded past that scene. I was like, I've watched this movie once. I'm done. Yeah, that's tough. <laughs> I've got a King Corso too, so it's like, no, don't want to see that. Oh man, that's what I said to to Lindsay. I was like, that looks like Zeke. Yeah, I was like, I was like, no, we're just gonna. 
right past this one. Now, Mr. Flanagan grew up Catholic and is now an atheist and has talked publicly about how this show was very personal to him in that, I guess you could say, life transition. And to me, the show felt very critical of religion. So I was very interested to hear your thoughts on on those themes in this show, Aaron. I don't know that I would say that it was critical on religion or, or God as much as it's critical on religion. Because it is critical on religious people and religious like practices that are are you know different or ridiculous that kind of like points out the the silliness of some of that. But it also like Aaron Green's whole monologue about what we mean when we say God. Right? Like that can be interpreted as many religious or spiritual people's interpretation of of god for them and i don't feel that the show itself necessarily poo-poos that thought i think that it more or less addresses the bevs the the monsignors um even to some degree the rileys the atheists who just are have lost faith completely it also offers the aaron greens who have had loss and are rationalizing and justifying what they're going through. So I, I don't know. To me, it, it offers a lot of different perspectives. And I think that at the end of the day, you know, with a lot of things, uh, you, you see what you need to see, want to see, right? Like uh, uh, my, one of my favorite stories is Ernest Hemingway was, was asked by a guy, what's the, like about the old man in the sea and all these different like motifs and themes. And, and Ernest Hemingway was like, you know, the old man's an old man, the sea's the sea, the boat's the boat. <laughs> <laughs> and it it really comes down to what you want to see. I I see this as one where it's kind of like it's critical of religion, but I also see my own to some degree perspective on on God. And I I think that the 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 Hindus or the Buddhists would also see their perspective represented in some way. I think that in the West, we, we very much unify Christianity and religion. And I think that this is more of a critique of Western Christianity. Because even like with, with the sheriff, right? And him talking about like, we know Jesus and like pointing out the, the fact that Islam has, you know, is a branch of Abrahamic faith, right? And most Christians are unaware of that, right? And that it's been around for, you know, almost a thousand years, yet they don't know that Jesus is a part of the Islamic religion. So Bev says, oh, we learn something every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that I, I like that, that it, that goes with the, the criticism of the ignorant Christians. So I, I don't know. I, he, maybe he's just like, I hate all religion and I hate God. But I didn't necessarily see this as a, as a I hate God story as much as a critique of, of organized religion. Yeah, very much so. That, that's interesting what you said about it being kind of a, may, maybe this is a Rorschach test for for your thoughts on religion, because I personally really resonated with Riley's thoughts on people who tell him that God has a plan. Mm -hmm. uh, Same. Because I've, I've been doing a job for 10 years where every single day I talk to people who are, are suffering and dying in the street, literally. And when people tell me that there is, a plan by some almighty, I, I think just like Riley, like how, how can you possibly tell me that if you think that you come from a place of tremendous privilege and that, that stuff was right at the beginning. And I think maybe that, that primed me to, to start looking for, <laughs> for anti-religious overtones. Yeah. But I guess that's, that's what I mean is even at the end though, the very finale is Aaron Green's monologue, right? So so you start off with Riley's perspective, but you end with Aaron Green's, right? And hers is is a little bit more of the the universe is God and 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 the universe is experiencing itself. It's like a mixture of of her original thought and Riley's, right? It's kind of a a hodgepodge of those two at the end. So mm -hmm. I I I definitely think that you can slice it multiple different ways. But I also think that at the end of the day, that's that's one of the hard things about religion is Bev is interpreting what's happening, right? She sees revelation unfolding. And that's kind of what, what humans do is 
You know, you give them a book that tells them this is the one true religion and they tell you how they read it and that's everything else is wrong. (laughs) That was one of the realest parts of Bev was that no matter the context, no matter what side of the argument she needed, she had a quote from scripture. Yep. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those were contradicting ideas, but it didn't matter because she had a quote. Yep. The show does capture a lot of real archetypes of people. And I think that that's something that Flanagan does well in these stories is he captures kind of like an archetypal person in Riley, in Aaron Green, in Monsignor, in Bev. And whenever you watch the show, you know someone that is a Riley, that is a Bev, that is, you know, the Monsignor, the true believer. And it it helps you maybe start to identify with the story some, or at least that's maybe I should say it helps me too. I thought a lot of parts were really well written, although I thought like they're a little bit too well written, like they're very well written and saying what they want to say and saying it in a very awesome way. But it's like no human could ever speak so eloquently as to the way they speak. Like the mom of the missing kid. Like, it's not supposed to matter that we're poor. You know, like she's going to know to say that even. Well, just like just like the flow of uh, Lizzie's like dump on Joe or whatever. Like, I'm sure she's practiced so that. I'm surprised she's practiced. I'm, I mean, I know she's practiced her, that speech probably in her head a million times, but it never comes out that way. When yeah. you actually go to deliver it. Are you, are you saying that the Aaron Sorkin version of the universe is more real? <laughs> <laughs> where, where, where everyone's on crack cocaine giving like that same monologue in 30 seconds? Yeah. <laughs> no, I agree. I think that this is a, a show written by someone who in their head gives monologues. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So like every character gets their monologue moments. Because it's like, what would I say if I was this character? (laughs) It felt like you have this show at one end of the spectrum, and then you have, like, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel at the other (laughs) in terms of, like, monologue versus dialogue. Mm. And I got to be honest, I prefer the Marvelous Mrs. Maisel end of that spectrum. Eh, it depends. Like, I I don't know. I'm, I'm someone who monologues, so... Doesn't doesn't really come off to me as something that bothers me. Did y'all have anything that you like wanted to happen that didn't happen? I guess I was I'm always like looking for too many things that don't exist, I guess, in shows that are kind of mysterious. Like I kind of like halfway I guess it would have been a rip off of the leftovers, but I kinda of thought that like maybe the Monsignor or like before we knew he was a Monsignor, like the young priest could like sense people's like problems, I guess, or something. I thought kind of like he kind of gives Riley a look when they first meet. I thought maybe he saw like, I thought that girl was maybe latched onto him that he killed, like either by his guilt or whatever. Like I thought, I thought that was going to play some, like be more than just like his guilt every time he went to sleep. And I kind of thought, uh, I kind of thought Riley was a vampire because like, it seems like the first time he goes home, he like stands outside the fence until his mom's like, come on in like he was had to be invited into his house i was like oh i wonder if they're setting this up for like later like he's actually been the vampire dude i think it's a good catch like i think that flanagan's the kind of director writer who would put little easter eggs right i think that he would put easter eggs and i think that that's i would say that's kind of like an easter egg to just general vampire lore because clearly the vampire did not have to be invited in well, we could have just not seen him be invited in. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, no, he ran into those people's houses to the yeah. window. Never mind. Yeah. He just kind of did whatever he wanted. And he didn't burn. No one burned from touching crucifixes or. Yeah. Religious articles things. didn't have any power. Just yeah. the sun. Speaking of the sun. Shut up about the sun. Shut up about the sun. This show had maybe the most unintentionally funny or the funniest unintentionally funny moment in a show I've ever seen, which was right at the end of, I think, episode five, Riley's death. Yeah. Oh, my God. Hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. Of her screaming as he bursts into flames? Yeah. (laughs) Because he's he's imagining himself with the, the girl that he killed, and she's no longer injured. 
and I'm starting to think, oh, wow, he's he's forgiving himself and he's going to be able to move on to a world where he and and this other little girl who he he hurt are able to to move past it and forgive each other and then smash cut to scream queen and you know the what was that nicholas cage movie where he's on the motorcycle uh with the whips and the chains ghost rider ghost, ghost rider? rider yeah he's basically ghost rider like I I couldn't stop laughing. I couldn't <laughs> I couldn't control myself. I couldn't stop thinking how big a dick did Riley have to be to row her out to the middle of the lake so she had to row herself back. I know how could he do that to her after she lost her kid? Like I was like, okay, you you just said you just didn't eat her this whole time. Like it's 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 clearly not a problem. And you're like, you didn't want to go anywhere. Like you just sat there and and ate the sun anyways. You couldn't have done that on the beach. Let us burn down some houses around you. Maybe you won't run into the burning building. It seemed fine before they said they were 30 miles away, like later in the show. Like before I thought he took her exactly like halfway. He's like, I just want you to go the other half. We're halfway there. Like just leave and don't come back. And then like she would choose to like go back halfway. But then after that, it lost a lot of that when they're like, oh, it's 30 miles. There's no way anybody can row that far. I'm like, okay. That really took it out. Exactly. That's what I was saying at the end where they were like, oh, it's way too far. And I kept saying, Aaron, you just rode half that. So what's the deal? She didn't row half that. They were just like out in the middle of the yeah, water. That was misleading. Like Tony said, I, I, I felt a little misled yes. thinking that they were literally halfway to shore giving her that choice. And then everything that Aaron did after that, I thought made no sense. Where she just watched this guy burst into flames in the boat in front of her, and she's just like, you know what, I'm just going to join the candle-wielding singing mob and maybe go well, sit down and did, enjoy some mess. They did notice that the dude who was the right-hand man to Bev was working on all the boats. So I think that they were quote-unquote playing along, hoping to figure out a time when they could get away. And things did not go the way they expected. But I I also think that, like, I, I didn't understand, like, ri- why didn't Riley do something? You at least got some blood. You have enough to sustain yourself for a while. Why not do something to try and save your family? That's right? what I thought he was going to do. Like, be a baller. Be a vampire baller, bro. Let, he wrote him those letters. Right, yeah, you know, write letters and then, you know, just kill yourself. I, I, I don't know. To me. Dear family. <laughs> I was disappointed that Riley went that route at that point. Like you're mad at Monsignor, you're mad at yourself, you're all these things. And your answer is to now I can kill myself with sunlight. So I'm going to do it. I, I don't know why that made sense. I don't disagree with him killing himself. Cause I feel like that maybe was the only way to prove to somebody it after. that it was real. No, no. You put your hand in the sun. Yeah. You could just like burn your hand off. There's blood bur- bursting <laughs> at the doctor's office. They didn't have to burn Riley Finn, Finn to a crisp to figure out, you know what? There's something up with this blood. Maybe we should take a deeper look at it. How's that doctor lady not have a friend where she can mail it Hello, doctor ladies. in a freaking sunproof container and be like, hey, run tests on this. And then after you've done all your tests, I want you to stick this into ultraviolet light. just put it in one of those beer bottles, right? That's why they put them in green, <laughs> right? <laughs> And make sure it's in brown packaging. Yeah. Good lord. But can you imagine how bad that smells? Like blood that bursts into flames. Oh, yeah. Probably oh, horrible. Horrible. Jesus. I did. Also- you know. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. And I was like, I know it's just like we're not there. Like you can't age people up with CG or even practical effects, especially when everything's HD now. But I'm like, at the beginning of the show, I'm like, these people are all aged the fuck up. Like, are we doing like a massive flashback section? Like, I knew something had to happen where everyone was younger. Either a flashback or like, yeah, they were going to all de-age. Yeah, you read my mind. I was just going to say that. That especially even Bev, she wasn't even aged. They just put like ugly makeup on her. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like, in, if you've ever watched Star Trek Voyager, you'd think she had the phage, which is this, like, skin disease where it's, like, peeling off and, and everybody in the galaxy dies. They put a stencil and spray-painted freckles on her. Yeah, right? <laughs> they just held it, it up to her like, face. It felt like I was watching The Witcher again, where it, there was, like, the humpback chick, and you're like, okay, you're obviously hot. Like, what is, you know, when are we going to have the magical transfiguration? Mm-hmm. 
You got to suspend some level of reality to enjoy fantasy, Jay. <laughs> it was just weird because, like, they just use different actors in the other, like, the Haunting of Hill House. Yeah, but the aging was, like, 20 years. This was, like, they went to their peak self. What about the doctor's mom? So I was saying, peak self. I mean, I think two different eras you can get away with different actors oh, but yeah. a matter of days or weeks and a person transforming you really do need to have the same actor Pretty can't associate it yeah look i'm i'm just saying people went and watched the nutty professor and everyone knows that eddie murphy was not that fat so my kid lately has been obsessed with scooby doo and I, I'm not mad about that at all. I fucking love it. And it's, it's, he especially loves the oldest, oldest ones. Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? From like 1969. The cartoons? But yesterday we were watching the 2002 Scooby-Doo movie with Freddie Prinze Jr. Mm. and Sarah Michelle Gellar, uh, Linda Cardinelli, mm. the guy from The Return is Shaggy. Oh, you talking? Matthew Lillard, do not even, you cannot call him just the guy <laughs> from The Return. That is like the most iconic performance of Shaggy that will ever be done. <laughs> yeah, abs- absolutely. But the the CGI Bad. in that movie, like Nutty Professor is leaps and bounds ahead of. <laughs> I just I just want to say, unless you are watching for some reason Starship Troopers 1997, all other CG doesn't hold up. I'm I'm just <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Starship Troopers, I've watched it recently. It's great. It's fun. But most CG, hell, even the frame rate in Jurassic Park at times, I was like, ooh, that dinosaur looks like it is green screened in there. I had this weird, I don't know if it was just like the camera focus angle or whatever. Like I had this weird, like when Riley walks out, when the sun finally goes down and he walks out and he like walks off to the left and then the Monsignor walks out and he walks off to the right, the church, like the grass in the church just felt like a green screen. Like, mm-hmm. and I don't know why. I mean, obviously because if he's that, having all that visuals. stuff existed, huh? He's having like, that's when he's having the visuals. Like when no, he's having the no, lights. you weren't, you, were, you weren't even looking through his eyes yet. You were just like, literally no. like you were looking out the rec center door and he like walks out and like there's just like the grass in the church just did not look real mm. at all. And then he like walks off to the left and then the preacher walks off to the right. I don't know, like random spots, like the all the sunsets looked way too like the lighting when it wasn't looking at the sky, like on people's clothes and like the area looked like perfect and awesome. And then every time it showed the actual sunset, it would look like not good. I'd like to know why it was illegal in this town to paint any of the buildings. <laughs> <laughs> Probably just the weather, salt water, right? <laughs> but every building is just that equally, just a little bit distressed. Like when you go to the Jaws portion of Universal Studios, maybe it was just filmed at that portion of Universal Studios. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's just on that island. <laughs> I I started to wonder if maybe a different setting than than an island could have served the story a little better. Like I was wondering if what if what if this could be a West Virginia coal mining town? And so then the whole part of it being an economically depressed area that gets a little bit punchier. And you can still isolate it by having it be up a mountain and oh no, like there was a landslide no, and the road. Here, got here's here's how you do it. The the religious people that find the angel are snake handlers. There you go. Right? And there's they're like super religious, like Pentecostal, speaking in tongues, snake handling, like, you know, all the nine yards. And they find the angel and they're like telling everyone the angel bites are snake bites. Did I miss some piece of like can the vampire not travel over water or something or Yeah, that's like isn't that vampire lore? That's like vampire lore, like usually it well no. Usually you have to be like transported with holy dirt, like sacred ground. And I thought that's like the box was for. Right. But no, then like just, at the he end. He just put him in it. He just was like, you, you go in there. Yeah. Like that just kind of threw me off. Cause like, I'm like, why is this dude like in desperation? He's like trying to fly over to the town that's 30 miles away. Free food though. That's but his why. wings are messed up. Yeah. Well, it's free like, food. Why don't you just island. go to the big city? Yeah. Well, why not just like eat all you want? 
But up until then, he had no reason to leave, right? Like, there was free food here. You know, if you're thousands of years old, you're probably predisposed to being complacent. Yeah. So if you find some food, you're just going to exhaust it. I just yeah. don't get why he just didn't, like, uh, I mean, even if he wanted to go to the island, why not just, like, uh, fly in at nighttime? Like, why go the, through the whole box thing? Like, obviously, there's a mainland 30 miles away that the ferry came from, so he was already there. Just uh, do a little glide over. Come Monsignor nighttime. was obviously very convincing. He's like, we've got a great church. You're going to love Bev. <laughs> Her face is not flaky. It's not flaky at all. At least by the time you at see all. it, you won't you won't see any flakes. You know, we we outlawed head and shoulders twenty years ago, and no one has looked. Plus, he needed the sacrament, so he was like, "You got to stay around so that I can get you to give me some more vampire blood." See, I thought that's why he died. I thought he was subsisting off of the vampire's blood. That's the only thing they could like sustain his life force and i didn't realize he got poison i thought he, i thought the dude just hadn't showed up in a while and he ran out of the sacrament and he, his body just like shut down because it's only been living off of the vampire blood the indication is that through like people talking in town bev, because of the implication yeah the implication <laughs> bev, bev they're on an island yeah i mean he could say no but he's not gonna say no because of the implication okay that, <laughs> <laughs> that seems really dark now no, it's not dark you're misunderstanding me well i mean well here, here's the thing monsignor did say no and bev poisoned him so that's that's the implication there so she what ran everything. No to? Well, she ran everything when he was the old version of himself and had Alzheimer's, right? Someone who has that level of dementia that the guy does in Israel is not running a church, right? So who is? Bev is. Bev is the one doing, making the decisions. Bev is the one making the rec center, right? Because with the settlement money that they got to donate to the church. So Bev is essentially the king of the castle and young Monsignor comes in and is taking back control. Right. And she poisons the dog. And then all of a sudden she poisons the Monsignor and he goes back to life. And then he eats someone. And she's like, hey, here's a guy who, who will murder for God just like me. What was her plan, though? Like the dog thing has an excuse, like it's plausible deniability. But when the pastor of your church dies in the exact same way and then they test his blood, like they obviously tested the dog's blood and they find the same poison like uh what was her plan off if that one if he didn't come back to life as a vampire she's already suspect number one but remember the picture the picture of monsignor in the cabin he's young. i did like that little i did like that piece because it never showed what she was looking at before and then in a later episode it showed it yeah so i think she realized that something wasn't right now why she jumped to killing him i think that that's a, a bev question but again, she saw scripture and everything, right? So as as she said, Monsignor did in three minutes what Jesus did in three days. Hmm. <laughs> so are we, uh, are we ready to score? Yeah, I, I think, think so. so. Mm-hmm. Aaron, do you want to lead us off? This was your pick. For sure. I think that the second time around, I will say that without the reveal, without the the kind of surprise, it it kind of loses a little bit of its luster. But I still really enjoyed it as a vampire take. I think it's a creative and original take. I thought there were some amazing, absolutely phenomenal performances. Um, But I also felt like there were some inconsistencies and some parts of the story I had to look up to figure out what was going on. That's not the best method of storytelling, in my opinion, when you have to figure out something by looking it up. Although, oh, like in a companion piece published after the fact? No, like in a Wikipedia. Like at least a companion <laughs> piece, you're like, hey, I intentionally made this obscure. Like, whereas if you just have to go to Reddit and read somebody explain, explain oh, by the way, I connected these dots that are hard to see. Mm-hmm. Was it a Twister reveal that it was was the vampires? Was that the Twister reveal? Uh, the, I'm reveal? Just, the, 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 the fact that like what's happening, it's vampires and, and religion and all this stuff and mm-hmm. what what the plan was. I, I when I first watched it, I was really like on the edge of my seat. Like Riley, whether or not he lives or dies, right? At the end of that episode where the vampire grabs him. Oh yeah, that caught me off guard. Caught yeah. me off guard. There were some moments that I felt like the first time I watched it, I was like, oh, what's gonna happen? This time I was like, Oh, I know what's happening. And I again I think that that's why Flanagan's good with the the one and dones. I'd give it I think it's another seven five. 
I think it's a solid show. I think for Halloween time, it's a great recommendation. Um, I think that especially if you're tired with the glittery or the Nosferatu vampire story, then this is a fun take. 7.5 of, ooh, 7.5 of what? Uh, Holy Sacraments. Mm. Holy Sacraments. 7.5 Holy Sacraments. How about you, Tony? I think I'm a 7 Holy Sacraments. I did really like the show. I like the ambiance, the acting, like we've said, is top notch. I think Flanagan, all his shows are really good. But it kind of like just lost me at the end. Like, it's something. I don't think I'm just like not a monster horror type of person. I'm more of like the demon ghost, like paranormal one. I guess it's still paranormal, kind of, but. Uh, I think I'm more of that style of horror than the monster. It's like. More possession this, over monster. Yeah, I mean, this monster actually finally looked good for once. Like, yeah. I mean, every time I see a monster in a movie where it's like it's always hidden and then it finally shows it, it always looks dumb, like so bad. And they actually did a good job on this one. Like, it actually looked good. Didn't Cloverfield it? Yeah, but I, I didn't... It kind of fell off at the end, like, just like... Yeah, like, why didn't they just take a hole? Why didn't they just go into a dark place? Like, a, truly, there's like a cave or a grotto on this island somewhere. Uh, some shade the vampires could hide in or all that jazz. Like, I don't know. I just had different expectations, I guess, for the ending, so I kind of fell off at the end. But I did really like it. Uh, it's only seven episodes. Definitely worth a watch, especially in the spooky season. Uh, uh, uh. That's all I got to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> seven Holy Sacraments from Tony. For me, I came in here ready to to rip this show a little bit more. I think I came in at a four. But after our conversation here, I think I'm a little more positive about this show. Uh, especially because I, I missed some of those things that the people on Reddit pointed out. So I was really confused by some of the vampire mechanics. And I thought that they didn't really work. But that explanation about the, the poisoning with the priest, that actually kind of that fits some of those puzzle pieces together. But this show, it, I don't know. It, it occupies a, a weird place in my mind where I enjoyed it, but I didn't really think it was all that good. And I, I'm kind I of struggling that. to articulate that. Like, like what you said about this is a great recommendation for spooky season. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I don't think I would ever talk anybody out of watching this show, but it, you know, is it a classic? No, no, not really. So I think we're going to land at a five, five Holy Sacraments. That's fair. All right. We got seven and a half from Aaron, seven from T- Tony, five from me. That gives us a composite score of 6.5. Hey, not bad. Not bad. Mm-hmm. Very. All right. And now I will bluff my way into my own Facebook <laughs> count to see where that <laughs> that ranks in our all time order. And while you're doing that, I will bring up the wheel. Oh, oh I keep forgetting. Good. I'm glad you're holding up, holding up on that, Jay, because I keep I keep <laughs> dropping the ball <laughs> on the chanting. That wasn't me. I don't know. I don't know what that you're talking was about. Was an angel, or was it a vampire? <laughs> I didn't hate the bursting into flames on the boat as much as you did. Cause I like, I thought maybe at the end, like he, like he was having the opposite experience that he thought, like he like met that girl's spirit and they were going to go off to heaven. Like maybe he like refound his religion. And even though I don't agree with that, I was like, Oh, that's kind of like a nice, that's kind of how I took it and interpreted that. But I didn't like, I wish Aaron would have stuck with her thing. And I wish she would have met her little daughter, like in her dad or something like, Mm-hmm. That's what she would have believed, even if it was like the DMT dream thing, like neurons firing, like she said, like that could have been her dream, like that she wanted at the end. I kind of wish they would have kept that for her. All right. Well, 6.5 puts this about in the middle, maybe a little bit under halfway tied with season one of Man in the High Castle, tied with seasons one and two of Letter Kenny, just below Miracle Workers, just above Happy. Okay. Better than Buffy. Better than Buffy. Better than his dark materials. Well, shall uh, we approach the wheel? <laughs> don't, don't, like, Buffy didn't hurt me. His dark materials hurt. Yeah. You know what I think I like about Mike Flanagan shows? 
mm. I guess before we spin the wheel is uh Final thoughts. I like to say he like plants the seeds like I don't know what other shows do it, but he's good about like uh, foreshadowing. At the beginning, that girl's like, I don't want to smell like cat shit. And then you realize later it's because the island has cats all over it and there's cat shit everywhere. And then like a bigger hint than that is when she like looks at that dude and you're like, oh, obviously you figure out he's involved with the accident, but you just don't know what happened. And then you find out later. But I like it when like storytellers do that kind of stuff where it feels, it makes the world feel more like lived Authentic. in, I guess. And so it's like, they still explain it, but it's like they drop a little more foreshadowing hints like that. It's like there's a little thread and it slowly unravels till you get the full picture. Yeah. I like that too. Well, looking to the wheel of randomonium. I am bringing for my offering this week or this month, this fool on Hulu. Um, it is very, I watched the first episode and I, I thought it was funny enough that I wanted to give it a try. There's, some cringe, but it's essentially about uh, a hugs, not thugs, rehabilitation center, and this guy who works at it, and his cousin who's getting out of prison, and they're trying to rehabilitate him. So, uh, it, it looked funny. I don't know anything about the other two, so Foundation, that was Tony. Yeah, I'm looking it up on the fly. <laughs> I know it's based on a series of stories by Isaac Asimov, sci-fi. <laughs> <laughs> Just it's it's Eva Eldris in space. Is it Eidr is Idris Elba in it? Idris Elba, yeah. Isn't uh Rebecca Ferguson in it too? I think so. And like the Elf King from Lord of the Rings. What does it say? The premise. Foundation chronicles a thousand year saga of the Foundation, a band of exiles who discover the only way to save the Galactic Empires from destruction is to defy it. So Aaron, I think you're definitely thinking of a different show. I think you also might be confused about the the actor's name Idris Elba. I did say it backwards. <laughs> yes, uh, but no, he's in a different Apple show. This is a, a sci-fi show. Oh, I thought I kept seeing his a... face on the Foundation when we watched that other Apple show. <laughs> he's no, like he's on a hijack or something like that. Yeah, it, it's about a, a plane that gets hijacked. <laughs> that's the show with the the pie maker, the guy that's in Guardians of the Galaxy, the blue guy. If it's from the big blue guy, there's really nothing I can do. Yeah, Lee Pace. Lee Pace. Okay, I remember now. Yeah. <laughs> I've watched the first season and, and some of the second. I really, really enjoy it. I would love to hear what you guys think about it as well, because I, I know one other person who've watched it. It's my father-in-law. So I want to talk to someone other than my father-in-law about this dumb show. <laughs> <laughs> it's dumb? Oh, okay. Oh, no, no, no. Just, you know, in the grand scheme of things. Oh, I see. Because football started. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I got to watch some. Well, tell us about Miss Davis. <laughs> I have nominated, I think this is at least the second time, uh, Mrs. Davis. It's a Peacock original show about an, uh, a Catholic nun who battles an evil artificial intelligence system. So I am keeping it in the church, so what? to speak. Oh, this sounds what? awesome. Is this, um, it's is this from, produced by Elon Musk? Uh, Damon Lindelof. Oh, okay. So I've I don't know anybody who's watched it. I've heard some good things. I know the three of us are big Damon fans. So fingers crossed. All right, I'm shuffling. I'm shuffling. Speaking of nuns, I hear the nun two is actually supposed to be decent. Mm. Well, what I what I heard is that Warrior Nun was not so. <laughs> Season two. <laughs> I hear she goes kind of like by tendencies. So I mean, like lead, the lead actress is hot. I go. I'll give her that. Was that the spin? Let's spin the McConaughey wheel. That was the spin. Hey, Mrs. Davis on Peacock. Excellent. So we're driving Miss Davis over here. All right, so check that show out on Peacock. Let me see how many episodes. Is that how you spell Miss? Is that how you write out MRS? I he say Mrs. or Miss? Uh, it is Mrs. It's in the I in thought the it was branding for the show. US. It's styled as MRS. Period. Okay. But that's an abbreviation for M I S S E S. Mm. What about? Is there a U S? Mrs. <laughs> that's like a colloquialism. Is it? 
That's yeah, what I've that's, seen. That's, a person's wife. M I S S U S. Is it both? Maybe they both. Oh wow! I always thought with the U that was like a it, like a Southern slang thing, like my missus. Oh geez, I shouldn't do voices. You shouldn't do voices, but it was very funny. <laughs> We're gonna cut that out. <laughs> we'll we'll clip scrap it. it. We'll clip do it. an in post. <laughs> we'll Diane, fix it in post. Remove that section. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but Discord now has soundboards, so we're definitely going to need to make that into a clip. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, it was a ton of fun talking about Midnight Mass with both of you guys. I am looking forward to the next time with Mrs. Davis. I want to thank both of my co-hosts for joining me here today. Thank you both. You're welcome. It's a pleasure. And also with you. <laughs> <laughs> and with your spirit. Uh, oh, yeah. I forgot. I went back to the old ways. All right. Well, I will see you guys next time, and I will see all of you out there. Oh, I don't want to forget to thank our executive producer, Dick Wolf. Damn. And next time, I will. Until then, salutations and whatever. How do we? How do we? How do we end this? Uh, salutations. Adios. I want to know if he ever writes in and asks you why you keep saying that. Please tell us. Did you like those three Super Bowls?